Hello, 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 people. Welcome back to the MUFC MPB YouTube channel. I told you, I told you, I told you. We will always continue to bring you the best guests and the most connected individuals that we can. Joining me today is one of the most reliable and connected individuals in this Manchester United space from the United Muppeteers, James Rhodes, my friend. How are we today? And thank you so much for joining the MPB YouTube channel today. Yeah, doing great. Appreciate uh, you having me on. No, of course, the pleasure's all ours. And, you know, I just I just wanted to um to let you know, even even when I was at university, even throughout my years uh, of following Manchester United, it's always been a case of, well, well Muppeteers are reporting this, so clearly it might be this or that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a very good moment for me personally in terms of coming full circle with yourself. We've got so much to talk about, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about, obviously, pre-season. I believe you were in LA over the weekend. You caught a bit of Man United action. What can you tell us? What's the mood like? And is there a bit of optimism going into the new season? Yeah, there is. It's it's real interestingness because it's a it's a very different United than it used to be in terms of the overall feeling. And some of it's hard to describe when you're there. But you know, in in the past, a lot of times, you know, we talk about transfers, talk about things that would happen. Often, it felt like no matter how good they could be, no matter what would happen, things were just going to go wrong. Everything was going to go wrong. It wasn't going to work. Um, and when you talk to people around there and you get the kind of the, the feeling, it sort of made sense because United felt like this closed door at times. And this is sort of an odd thing to say, but for a long time, it felt like as a fan in trying to interact with, with the club and, and even as working in, in kind of this space and trying to connect with and interact with the club, that the club was almost like felt as if it was an enemy of the fans. And obviously that comes down from the ownership, you know, and how they deal with things, how they approach things that it was sort of always the opposite is so closed and so difficult and so hard to, to, to become or feel a part of the, the club, but it's very different now. I mean, very, very different. I was, I was in, I was out for uh, one of the games last year and it's a totally different world just in terms of the amount of communication that's there for people from members of Manchester United, uh, from the club itself, from the players, from everybody. And the mood is very, very positive. There is definitely, you know, just to call it what it is, there's definitely a positive vibe. I mean, you'd ask any of the, of the players, the, the staff involved, and it is a much more positive atmosphere overall, one that feels to everybody like there's really – progress being made and there's a clear togetherness that probably wasn't there before and, and I honestly think that that'll mean a lot more than people think it will you mm -hmm. know if you look at things because we felt like we've done a lot of great moves in the past and then it hasn't worked out and football and, and life's not always so linear like you just add one plus one and it's two and sometimes there's this underlying issue and and if things are negative things are bad things are feeling off no matter what you do it's just not going to work and uh and it's not like that anymore so it, it definitely gives me high hopes i i definitely left I, i've been optimistic but i definitely left with even a lot more optimism based on what i experienced there yeah, well, well, that's certainly a brilliant way to start off today's podcast, isn't it, really? A bit of optimism amongst the Manchester United faithful. Look, I really want to get into so much because we have got a lot to cover today. I'm going to start with this one because I've got a bit of a personal affiliation with Mateus De Ligt. I think he's a brilliant player. I think this could be, a, as I say, potentially an amazing move for Manchester United, for De Ligt and everyone else involved in this. Do you see this, however, as a situation where Man United must sell someone like a Lindelof in order to facilitate this move? And and what can you tell us about Delit? Because it's my understanding that he's very keen on a move to Old Trafford. Yeah, it is very much a sell to buy situation, pretty much across the board for United at this point in time. That was one thing that was made very, very clear. They really want to keep the signings going. They really want to get in at least two more players but they have to sell. They have to get the money for it. Um, you know, the, the financial position that United find themselves in is obviously not something that happened overnight and it's not something that was created by the, the current ownership. And I think they've done pretty brilliantly so far getting into really good young players that we probably wouldn't have been able to attract in years past um, and not by throwing excess wages on them that's going to cause problems down the road. 
Um, but for future moves and continued moves, they do need to sell to buy. They need to shift players on. And and uh, and yes, very likely Lindelof will be one who needs to depart in order for another centre-back to come in. It's a little bit of a tricky one with Matthias de Ligt because if they hadn't signed Lenny Oro, he'd probably be a Manchester United player already. Uh, he was definitely, uh, you know, the same position, same list, same spot. But Lenny Yoro is a bit of a higher priority simply due to, you know, the age and profile being sort of that unmissable talent they wanted to get in. And so after that, the focus was definitely initially at least shifted even off the lift a bit to the other side of this as of, of the uh, of the center back pairing because you don't really have a left-footed center back behind Lissandro Martinez. Ten Hag's very big on that uh, dynamic of a left-footed center back. You also have then the factor of De Ligt on on his wages that he's on, the costs associated. It gets a little more hard to stomach for a backup, you know, or, than a first teamer, but the injury to Lenny Oro may change things for sure. And that was a bit of an unknown at this point in time because there was a clear plan. I would have said a week ago that the lick was much less likely and they were still looking at the left-sided center backs. And there's plenty of reports about that. Uh, with the injury to Lenny Oro, it makes it, it just depends how long it's going to be, whether it changes the approach to things. If Lenny Oro is going to be out, and I don't mean to suggest this is the case. If Lenny Oro is going to be out for six months, you have to sign. The lick, I think you have to. You can't go without having a really good center back in that position, even though they're a bit different, but I think you have to. If he's going to be out for six weeks, then I don't think the plan changes very much. Um, but it's also about availability. You know, it's it's who can they get? You know, Gerard Braintwaite was obviously who they would have preferred, but it's the costs associated are excessive. Everton don't need to sell now, and that's become ever so unlikely as it stands. So yeah, I think it's definitely grown in chance in part because of the injury and needing to potentially add some more coverage on that side and get a good player in. Um, but it still would have to result be a, be a sale to get it happening. And it does have to be at a price they, they want. They're not going to go and overpay for him because that, it's not like they, they're definitely operating on a very specific plan. There's players they'll maybe overpay a little bit for, but even they have an upper limit. And they're going to stick to those values where they're saying, all right, well, the lick was presented to us as an opportunity that they didn't want him anymore. We're not going to pay 50 million plus for a player that you're trying to get rid of. You're going to have to do it for 35, 40 million, you know, with add-ons, with things like that in there. And then it becomes feasible. So it's it's a, a little bit is based as well on, on Bayern. If, if they're actually going to, offer kind of that deal price then it becomes a lot more viable yeah it's certainly one to keep your eye on isn't it because as you say it's almost like a domino yeah. effect a little bit isn't it in regards to potentially making a sale and then a, a signing can come through the door and i think this is a very familiar and relatable situation to the midfield uh options yes. should we call it at united now of course scott mctominay has been heavily linked with a with a move away from manchester united you know i think it was more concrete maybe a week or so ago and then things start to die down and now they're starting to pick up i think this is just a a, a gen a general sort of aspect of a transfer isn't it really it happens and it doesn't and it happens and it doesn't or whatever yes. but in regards to uh, Scott McTominay before we get onto that midfield in in terms of bringing a new player in what can you tell us about McTominay what have you heard will Fulham potentially go in again of course they've got their eye on one or two players at the moment but Scott McTominay what can you tell us about this individual at Manchester United potentially moving on yeah, well, you know, he's had he's been looking at his options, and that's sort of the important part of this because he doesn't have to leave. You know, he himself doesn't have to leave. Um, United are probably not going to sell him for fifteen million or something in that price range. Uh, understandably, they they're going to need enough from the sale to to justify and be able to replace. Um, especially given that they have not been able to move on Casemiro. And, uh, and that position is pretty stalled there. And, and they can, we can talk about more on that in a minute. But for, for, for McTominay, that means they need to get a decent price. And a lot of it comes down to him. He's been looking for... Um, he's been looking for... How would I put this? Like uh, options. He has been assessing options. He's been having people look and see where could he go? Where could he land? Because at, at his age, where he's looking at 
you know, he's not really that young anymore. You know, it, it's sort of like the Lingard thing where yeah, he was like, yeah. seemed like he was young forever, but McTominay's what, 27, 28 years old going on. And, and um, he's going to have probably one big contract and um, he's going to want that and he's going to want to play and he's not going to want to play a bit part role. And he's going to be a bit part player for United if he stays. Um, we pretty much didn't have Mason Mount all of last year. Uh, mm. He doesn't really fit into the deeper role. He doesn't really fit into the higher role. He, you know, he's a he's a utility player, a toolbox player who can score goals, but that's not really what United need at the moment. Uh, it's not really the have what you build with, and it's not going to get you a starting position. There's a lot of clubs you would start for. So I think it's really down to him looking for his options, where he wants to go, what he wants to look at, and then. Um, if they'll bring an offer to the table, Galatasaray are still very interested in him, but they just, they don't have the fee. They can't pay 30 million. They continue to look and try to make kind of basic offers, but they just don't have the money. I mean, I, I don't think any of those clubs have ever paid 30 million for a player before. Um, and then Fulham will probably come back in as well. And I think they could, uh, they could definitely make a higher offer that would be suitable. And um, if McTominay wants to go, then, he will go. If he wants to take it, then they'll accept that. If it's anywhere near 30, then I think they'll accept that. And that'll give them the ability to, um, to do that. So I, I do think this one is still leaning towards more likely than unlikely that he is sold uh, just because it would suit kind of everybody. And it really comes down to someone making a half decent offer. And I think Fulham can and are looking at it. So that's probably the most likely landing spot. Yeah, yeah, I'm inclined to agree with it, mate. Uh, just in terms of Casemiro, you mentioned that. Just quickly, uh, a word on Casemiro. I think it was almost a forgotten story because it was so certain, wasn't it, that he was going to head to Saudi Arabia. It was yeah, almost, as I yeah. say, like a non-story, wasn't it? It was right, he's going to move on. But there have been a few reports recently, haven't there, in the last week or so, suggesting that he is not only open to staying, but this could really be a huge possibility that he does stay at Manchester United. So what have you heard about Casemiro? Is leaving still a possibility or is he likely to stay at United? From the discussions I had recently, and including over the weekend while I was in Los Angeles, I would definitely lean towards him staying at this point in time. It's definitely become a lot more likely. and even a shift in focus to how can we get the most out of Casemiro this year? Can we have a bounce back season for Casemiro this season? And, um, and just, that's kind of the narrative shift, you know, from he's leaving to could this be a bounce back year for Casemiro? And that kind of tells you that there's nowhere for him to land and they need to figure that out. You know, that that's just sort of how it goes. You start looking at it and saying, okay, well, if you can't go, what can we do, you know, to make this useful? And, and honestly, I think, there's some merit in that if, you know, they've played rather than leaving him alone in the midfield, playing in a two uh, will cover up, you know, some of the, the, where he doesn't have quite the legs that he used to have. Um, so there's some tactical adjustments that I think will make the team better. Getting another player into the midfield where he doesn't have to start and he can be a rotation, a substitute, these types of things would also help. But yeah, the issue is that, it's kind of twofold. Number one, I, I mentioned that, you know, a club came in for, for example, came in from Marcus Rashford from Saudi and, um, and they rejected the offer kind of outright, but there was a, there's also alongside that very much a kind of an idea that the Saudi clubs wanted to get younger players, you know, change tack a little bit for understandable reasons. They want to build the league a little more naturally and not just have a bunch of overpaid older stars in the league, which it doesn't have a long, lot of longevity. Right. And it's had some some difficulties where some of them leaving things like that, and so it's understandable they would rather get in some younger players, um, you know, who are up and coming and really build up the competitiveness of the league. And so they've they've changed in strategy financially. There were concerns over Casemiro's fitness. You know, they didn't want to even for other clubs coming in for him. So it's become a lot more plausible that he stays at this point. Uh, if another offer were to, if someone were to actually make an offer to get him, then he would go, but it's just become really unlikely. And I don't think United at this point are expecting any offers for Casemiro to, to come in. And, um, and so the view is how can we get the most out of Casemiro? What can we do to, to have a bounce back season? And, um, and that seems like the most likely outcome now, despite, despite everything, uh, at this point in time. Yeah, it, as I say, it was almost a, 
a bit of a backdrop, wasn't it, that he was about to yeah. leave and all of that. No problem at all. But like you say, things change. And it links back a little bit to what you said at the start of the show that in regards to this positive aspect, it's it's not a negative yeah. in, in, in terms of, okay, well, Casimir is not leaving. We were hoping he was for whatever reason. It's going, okay, right, well, how can we utilise him to benefit the side, which again yes. is, a, is a massive yes. positive. I think one big name, which has been a constant name, almost a little bit of a saga, if you like, in regards to Manchester United's pursuit of a midfielder, is a certain Manuel Ugarte. Now, of yeah. course, I was talking about him a little bit earlier ago on another show that I was doing. It's not a situation where PSG are looking at him and thinking, right, he's not good enough. It's firmly a situation where they believe that João Neves is the next midfield superstar. So they're trying to pave a way for him. And I understand that that is progressing really positively which would then potentially, if I'm not mistaken, open P open PSG's stance in regards to maybe being a little bit more fluid in a potential deal. But what is the latest on Agati to United? Is the deal progressing at all? And how much would a fee be? What can you tell us about this potential move? Yeah, well, there's a few factors here. In, and again, kind of that, that domino effect. Because what you said about Joe Neves is basically the, the exact situation there. Um Jao Neves, Ugarte, both represented by Georgia Mendes and um, does a lot of work with PSG. And, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, was involved uh, with Lenny Yoro coming to us as well. The Ineos leadership have a very good relationship with him. They've had a good relationship with him for some time. They've been speaking with him and talking to him since before they got into the club. You know, obviously they own a club in France and and they have a good relationship there. And so there's a factor in that of like, how can everybody get what they want out of this situation? United are very interested in Ugarte, but that's also tempered by cost. Um, he is not a player they want to overpay for either. You know, similar in a in a way to Matthias Delict, they're not going to pay, say, "All right, well, you, you know, you you need to move this player on because he doesn't fit in your plans." We're not going to pay more than you paid for him. We're not going to pay the same as what you paid for him. We need a deal. We want a deal here. Um, and at the same time, PSG don't want to make a 40, 50 million sale, then be talking to Benfica and have that Jao Neves price go way up, uh, which tends to happen. So essentially, I think they're looking at getting this deal for Jao Neves at 70 million plus some players. And then when that happens, the flexibility for them with Ugarte becomes definitely greater. Even the possibility of a loan and, and an obligation becomes possible. For United, that would be much more suitable, especially if it was a conditional obligation, which it sometimes is, where you know the player would have to play a certain number of games to trigger it to where he has to be bought. And, and that would work, right? If he's playing well and they want to keep playing him, then they would trigger the buy option. Uh, it would push the finances out on that buy a little bit later if it's conditional. And that would be something that um, would suit them because the finances are the problem at the end of the day. It's, it still comes down to the finances. They, you know, they, they looked last year, it was, it was something that went really under the radar. It was not reported by virtually anybody until quite a bit later, <clears throat> but I'd got wind of it on a few times. They made four or five loan plus option bids last summer for, you know, uh, I think it was like Taram and, and uh, Palacios from, from Leverkusen, a lot of good midfielders for this exact position of the six. They were interested in Ugarte, but they didn't have the money. And, and they're kind of, unfortunately, in a little bit of the same boat now because of Casemiro staying and being there. Uh, unless they can get that big sale of, of McTominay, then they're going to have to be quite flexible to get a midfielder in. And that's why Amrabat's name continues to be in the mix because if they cannot get a deal for Ugarte, if they cannot get a deal for one of the players that they would prefer, then to make up the numbers, they might have to turn to a very cheap, affordable deal for, for Sofian Amrabat. It, but it could even be something where they get another loan for him for eight, you know, five to eight million, even though his contract's expiring because there's nowhere else you know, Fiorentina don't have somewhere else to sell him. So he just gets a loan and his contract expires and you give a decent sized loan fee again if they don't want to sign him permanently, which they don't really want to. So that's also a possibility. So they're, they're, it's it's a it's very complicated. It's a bit of a tangle and it and it's really just because of the finances that uh, United are running into this situation. Um, and each year it'll get better and better as more players depart. But you know, that's uh, so there, there is there's a lot of options on the table. I, I still think that there's a good chance to get Ugarte, especially once John Evans is gone. They'll have some new talks with PSG after the, you know, after the tour, once John Evans gets done, once the players are all back. 
you know, so I would expect maybe next week we get a little bit more on that, especially things pick up for from a uh, Scott McTominay side as well. Yeah, for sure. Is I think the title of this episode should be Domino Effect because it just seems mm-hmm. like absolutely everything is is yep. related to one move that would allow and facilitate another move. <clears throat> And I think one that, again, fits this probably more than everything that we've spoken about so far is a sort of Maserawi to Manchester United. Now, of course, yes. I think the the big factor, again, very similar to what we were just talking about a minute ago with João Neves and Ugarte, potentially, is Juan Basaka. Now, of course, West Ham are heavily interested. I've been told myself that he is keen on a return to London. Um, who wouldn't? It's an amazing place to be. And West Ham are firmly interested in the signing of Wan Pasaka. So, is this as simple as it seems in terms of once Wan Pasaka gets done, it will be Maserawi to Manchester United? And what can you tell us about res- the both respective deals? Are personal terms agreed? And how quickly can we expect potentially a deal to happen on both sides? Yeah, um, I think it is pretty simple in terms of Wan Pasaka out, Maserawi in. You know, um, the interest in Maserawi is very genuine. With Juan Bissaka, the situation is, you know, Ineos' approach being that they don't want to keep players to run into their final year and, and walk away for free if they can replace him. He doesn't want to sign a new contract. He wants to go back to to London. Ideally, um, I think it suits everybody. It's a really sensible situation. The price for Masbrowi is there. So it was another one where I was told on the weekend in pretty straight that he's a, just sort of very likely to, to be leaving. And that was a kind of moving on and, uh, and, and quite close to happening. And then obviously there's been a lot of reports of it in the last few days. And basically where it is, I don't believe that they've agreed to anything with West Ham as of this time. I think wan has given his openness to joining West Ham uh, in kind of the newer discussions, but they're going to have to meet certain wage demands. And part of the, the what will make this work is United taking a lower, a bit of a lower fee that allows them to meet the wage demands that uh, Juan Bissaka would have, understandably, um, and to agree personal terms. I think they're all pretty close. It's the type of situation where everybody wants it to happen. And it's kind of everybody's choice for it to happen. There would be no issues with with the terms on Masrawi for him personally. Uh, so it, it's just one of those funny things where like the talks are all kind of there, but They've got to mostly agree with Wambasaka. Once they've agreed with Wambasaka, it'll go quickly, yeah. and uh, and so so that's the unknown part. But it's they, he's not closed to it. You know, he hasn't rejected and said, oh, "There's no way I'm moving to to West Ham." Uh, it just needs the right uh, the right deal, the right uh, the right offer to him, and that's what he's waiting for essentially. And then obviously part of it is that he's he's on tour and he's the only senior right back for United and. The only senior left back too, you know, there's no senior <laughs> fullbacks at United on this tour. And that is a real factor because you, you want to be able to yeah. play. You mm-hmm. need to have a good preseason. And, I, and I've told people this as well. I wouldn't really expect him to go until next week. Once they get back, it, it may even be that it's so close, but they're saying, look, we'll just finalize this when we're back because we need him for the next few games. And he's a professional. There's no bad blood between him and the club and, and all the parties on this. So, you know, everybody wants to, to make it go uh, of it. And, and you never know, like, if it didn't happen, you know, something else didn't happen, you, you, you want him to be ready to play and to, to assist the team and all of that. And so it's just one of those things. And, and so, again, I think once they're back from the tour, it probably moves pretty quickly, barring any unexpected circumstances. But there's an openness from him to join, and that's the key. Once they agree to that, the rest will just pretty much fall pretty quickly it's all it's all very simple after that yeah i'll, I'll be very careful to use the word simple and manchester united in the same sentence know, right? it, it never works unfortunately like that does it but no mm. I, I completely agree and you and you bring an, a brilliant point i know i laughed at it but it's it's bang on in terms of him being the only available fullback, which would then yep. lead me to my next question for yourself, is the left back situation. Now, I've always been under the understanding this summer that the spine of Manchester United was very important in regards to some new players coming in. They've already addressed a couple of them situations. Obviously, a midfielder, hopefully, expected to come through the door and maybe even another defender. But a left back, of course, with the difficulties of last season, Man United played virtually the whole of the season without a recognised left back. So what can you tell us about this? Is this a potential for Manchester United to explore in regards to a new left back? Are there even any names that you've heard? Or could we potentially be in another situation where Adalo, for instance, could be playing at left back next season if, of course, the injuries continue? 
Right. Well, there was like sort of your ideal names that they looked at in the past. Players like uh, Kirkus and uh, Ait Nuri that they would love to make a purchase like that if they could. But the just the cost associated with getting that kind of top fullback this summer, probably not feasible because, yes, the priority was the spine of the team, potentially two center backs. They've only got one, a midfielder they haven't got yet, you know. Um, they still have a lot of priorities in those areas to fill. Masrawi, one of the positives is, is definitely a view. He can play on both sides. And given that he doesn't, you know, that they're really happy with Diogo Dallo on the right as a fullback, they're not looking to upgrade on him. Um, Masrawi would be someone who would provide coverage for both sides. Uh, Dallo, very robust, very reliable, you know, and so you can kind of count on him to be healthy most of the season. Um, and Luke Shaw is, is there. So it's kind of like you would give three, three center backs for those two positions, which is better than we've had. Um, and I think they would feel like that's okay. Uh, you see how Malasia gets on. If he's not healthy by the January window and there's a need, then look to another short-term solution for depth there. Um, but I think that's more the view at this point in time. There was a hope, right, with Brainthwaite or someone like that on the left side who would also be able to provide that coverage that it, again, reduces the need simply because they really don't want to have to buy another center back and the left back. They just can't afford it. Um, and then what happens with Malasia? Because now you've got two left backs in there. If he does get fit, there's nowhere for him to go, but you're going to have trouble selling him because he hasn't been able to make it on the pitch in a year and a half by then. So it's a, another tangle, another tangle, mm -hmm. certainly. But I think the view is more likely um, as Rowie to potentially cover both sides. And then, you know, you make it to January, make it through a bit more of the season, see if Malasia can get fit. If you can, then good. If you can't, then you might want to reinforce in the in the January window. But um, you know, there was other names mentioned in an article last week that I think are that were like more affordable. Some of them are more affordable, some of them were not. Um, but I think that that was kind of when the Mesrawi thing was looking off again. So if it's on, ideally, it kills two birds with one stone yeah. in, in that respect. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I've only got a few more questions because I know you're a very busy individual, but I do want to just uh, pick your brains out for all your expertise. Yeah, of course. In terms of Jaden Sancho, now, of course, this is an individual who was almost, again, very similar to Casemiro, of course, for different reasons in regards to he is almost certainly going to leave Manchester United. There was this notion and almost like a bit of a briefing, really, across the media that if Eric Ten Hag stays, Jaden Sancho does not. But, of course, recently there seems to be some... Some, uh, shall we say, making up some, uh, some sorries, maybe. We don't, we don't actually have any reports of any official apologies, but we have been told that this has been a situation that's been put behind both parties. But there have been some links, haven't there, over the last week or so with a potential move to PSG. Of course, Dortmund are always lurking. They're a big fan of Jadon Sancho, but I think financially that was the big stumbling block for them, respectively. But with PSG and in a wider aspect of Jadon Sancho, where do you see this one going? Do you think he will be a Man United player come the, come the new season? Or if a, a sustainable bid does come in, could he even potentially go after after all of the making up that's happened? Yeah, um, sort of a double answer on that. Because one, if a good offer came in, yeah, he could go for sure. He absolutely could leave if a good offer came in. Um, he'd be open to it. They'd be open to it. But that doesn't mean it's bad either. You know, mm. this it's kind of like the the direction was everybody needs to be an adult, <laughs> basically. Mm. Everybody needs to grow up a little bit. And um and and that's part of putting things behind you and, and operating in a in a highly, you know, in a performance professional environment. You have a player who's on a lot of wages. United paid a lot of money for him, who essentially because of the situation, and I'm not saying who's at fault in something like this, but because of the situation was effectively worthless. You know, having a player you paid 72 million for who's on 250,000 a week, playing with the academy, you know, training with the academy doesn't actually help anyone. It, it does nothing for anybody, for the club. It's a lot of money. And unfortunately, the situation then became there's nowhere for him to go. Even if you wanted to say you wanted to sell him, you know, you can't sell him for nothing and take huge loss. And what United were looking at is saying, this isn't going to work. We're not going to loan him out and pay to it, pay a bunch of his wages for nothing for another club to just, to just not have him have a resource. Who's a good player. Jason Wilcox, of course, knows him from the city Academy. 
He knows mm-hmm. him. Uh, Dan Ashworth's big on English players as well, knows him too. And they looked at the situation and they were unhappy with how it went about. And that doesn't mean it's on Ten Hag. There's a lot of things that have been wrong at this club for a long time. And Sancho himself has a huge, huge part to play in that responsibility as well for his own career and his own life and the choices he's made. Um, but essentially said, look, we, we need to be grownups about this. We got to put it behind you. Get on the pitch. Get playing. If you do well, you stay. It works. We have another player. If you don't, or if an offer comes in, then you leave. Either way, it becomes then a win for everybody. But you can see just the fact of him playing in preseason and being a part of the team and that we can discuss that he might be here and be a regular contributor. You know, the backup to Marcus Rashford on the left side essentially is where he's been all preseason and makes the most sense for him. Um just by having that in place, now no club can look and say, we can't spend any money on him. He's he's not a player. He's not playing. You're never going to keep him. They have to look at it and say, yeah, we, we want to get paid. If you're going to take Jaden Sancho, you have to give us a good offer. So if a good offer comes in, yeah, the, then they could all depart. It's not like it's a huge – it's just – it's fine. It, it's okay. It's it's sort of just <laughs> even. Like you said, it, the past is the past. If a good offer comes in and he wants to take it, he'll go. And everybody say, great, thanks, good luck. And everybody be happy. If, if that doesn't happen, he'll stay. And they'd be happy to use him. And he's a member of the team. And that's just how it is. You don't have to – everybody doesn't have to be in love with each other for it to work. They just have to get along. It's a professional atmosphere. And, and that's really the key to it. Absolutely, not just in football, but in life, isn't that right, James? Yes, uh, yes. Just, just a, a final, final question for you. And this isn't to do with transfers. This isn't to do with any inside information. You're an individual who's followed United, who's covered United, who's reported yeah. on Manchester United for for a very, very long time now. You've seen the ups, you've seen the downs, and you've seen everything in between. Ineos now have provided a new dawn for Manchester United. Whether it's going to be a successful one is still out for us to see. But from what you've seen so far, from, of course, taking into consideration everything you've seen before Ineos's arrival, where do you stand with this new ownership? Do you think or do you believe it's given enough optimism for you to think that, right, Manchester United will be back on the right course to the glory days? Or do you think this could potentially be another thing that Manchester United need to proceed with caution, shall we say? What are your thoughts on the Ineos ownership at Manchester United? Yeah, well, obviously, it, it becomes hard to separate it out. I did a lot of reporting on on Ineos specifically in the build up to all of this happening because there's just good information I had, and and from that side, it always made me very optimistic because I felt that they were very serious people who had a lot of pre planning for all of this, and they really had a good idea in mind for where they wanted to take the club. Objectively, I think that they've shown a lot of good things. You know, they they've shown a lot of the positives that you'd want to see. I think they're doing everything about as right as can be the people that they're hiring. Omar Barada was a brilliant appointment for them. And, and to me, the key has always been with owners, right? It, it's sort of a funny thing because it's kind of less is more. I wanted them to appoint the right people and get out of the way. You don't want them interfering because Jim Ratcliffe doesn't know football better than you and I. You know, he, he doesn't. And that's not a, it's just a the reality of the situation. He doesn't know football better than you and I, and neither does Sir Dave Brailsford. You want people to be experts in the area that they're in. And, and it seems like that's what they've done. They've put those people in place and they're running the show. You know, Omar Barada, uh, Dan Ashworth are making the decisions. Jason Wilcox making the decisions. These are the guys making the decisions. And so given that it appears that they've kind of stepped back and they've let them really run things in that respect. Yes. Then, then I have a lot of optimism because while there's no guarantees, uh, you make the right decisions. You know, there's so much, there's so many variables, but as long as you're making the right decisions and you have the right people making the right decisions, they're going to get some wrong, but you have the right people. And if you do that, then you raise your odds significantly of succeeding. So I think there's going to be ups and downs. I think there's going to be things that they get wrong. Um, but I think everybody does. I think everybody does. And um, and I think that it's gonna, it might take a little longer to get back to the heights that people want. And there has to be some expectations tempered with that, that it's just the reality of climbing out of the hole United have been. Mm. You know, when I was talking about the mood, 
because there's a lot more wrong than just buy two more players. Mm. It's just a lot more that's been wrong than than just that. And those are the things that are fixing, but those are the things that you take time, that take time to develop and take time to build. Um, but I, I am optimistic. I think it's going to take two, three years before we really see top, top and like competing for the league, competing for titles. Um, but I think we will get there. I'm very optimistic. I'm, there's not much more they can do, I guess, than what they're doing right now. And uh, so you got to hope it's, a, it's enough, but, um, but there's a lot of good signs. Yeah, for sure. And you've given me a bit of optimism there. So your good deed of the day has been done there, James. I just want to say thank you so much for joining me. It's been absolutely brilliant. And as I've said at the start of the show, you know, I've I've, I've followed your, your career. I've followed a lot of your work that you've done for quite a long time and MUFC MPB have been desperate to get you on. We um we do highly respect the work that you've done and as a United fan, first and foremost, thank you for all the work you've done and of course, keep up the brilliant work, my friend. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. No worries at all. I'm sure we will try our best to get you on again soon. But more importantly, a massive thank you to everyone who has watched today's episode. Please be sure to like, subscribe. You know by now, the more you like, the more you subscribe, the more you interact, we can get brilliant guests like James on and we can continue to build this brilliant platform. And in the unlikely case, you don't follow James already. Follow him. He's right across everything Manchester United. No BS, no hidden agendas, just straight information as much as we'd like to do from both parties so as i say be sure like subscribe do all of that stuff you know all of that by now and be sure to join me again when i'm joined with another brilliant guest subscribe to the mufc mpb youtube channel